Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our talks with Walt as we are calling our readings through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We turn now to a poem called O Star of France, poem number 31 of the 38 of Autumn Rivulets. Of course, we've commented on autumn being that which is old, rivulets that which is new. And I want us to think a little bit about how in some ways, and we haven't commented a lot about this, but Whitman is in some ways a historian. We've, we've said that, you know, the five P's of Whitman, Whitman is person, Whitman is pedagogue, Whitman is philosopher. I've commented a couple of times that one of the things we haven't called Whitman and a P we could call him is Whitman is prophet or historian as we, as we might say it. And of course in the ancient traditional sense as the great Robert O'Dean has often pointed out that really when you're talking about prophets you're often talking about historians of a culture, a cultural historian. In other words, that is the capacity to kind of look and see and qualify what is happening. We're going to play that game here in this uh, in this little poem. Now, the assumptions for us are that you've been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net, down that left inside Talks with Walter playlist, and that you've been working with us from inscriptions all the way through and including some other poems that talked uh, about history and about events of the past. Uh, we did give a set of introductory comments for Autumn Rivulets. It's my hope that you will have followed that. And then we just finished with The Torch. Now, our Nortons, as we like to get our background information, speaking of history, our Nortons in, is important in this, po in this poem. We're told that this O Star of France, in the Franco-Prussian War of 1870-71, to obviously placed there in parenthetics, the defeat of France was acknowledged by the Treaty of Frankfurt of May 10th, 1871. Ratification by the new French reactionary government provoked a bloody insurrection of the Commune of Paris, of course, in May 21-28. This poem was first published June 1871 in the Galaxy, which actually paid Whitman $25. As we pointed out, Whitman didn't make much money off of the poems, which is kind of amazing to consider, but he didn't die a very, very wealthy man from, the, from this uh, collection of poems. The poem was then collected in As a uh, Strong Bird on Pinions Free and Other Poems of 1872, and it was reprinted in two rivulets in 1876, revised in Lisa Grass 1881. Now, the manuscript, that, to, to finish with Norton's, the manuscript in the British Museum agrees with that in the Franco-American Museum at Blarencourt, uh, as does the magazine text in giving the final line as, quote, shall rise immortal, end quote. All texts of this poem preceding that of Leeds of Grass 1881 are divided into four stanzas. Now, this is one of those poems that I find fascinating to, uh, to read and to discuss for a number of reasons. You'll remember that phrase, O Star, from Song of Myself 49, O Stars of Heaven, okay? And, the, uh, of course, this defeat of France is going to make this a fascinating study. That is to say, a study in civilizations rise of civilizations, and then the potential decline of civilizations. As we commented in our study of Plato's Republic, uh, you can find it at LearnStrong.net, especially as we call it the declension of state passage uh, as, as we were working with it in Book 8 and Book 9. We'll, we'll play a similar kind of game here. Whitman, of course, is going to be talking about uh, France a number of times through Leaves of Grass, um, and uh, you'll remember this, uh, the, the uh, moment yearning and thoughtful was the very first use of France. He'll begin. O star of France, by the way, the use of the word star following the poem called The Torch, I think is intentional. As I've said to you guys, I think Whitman is having a great time in Leaves of Grass, and I think here the placement matters. Because look at the next words. The brightness of thy hope, by the way, notice the language, the religious Puritan language of the, the Quaker language of thy here, of thy hope and strength and fame, notice the Trinity, like some proud ship. Now this is an interesting simile because if you've been reading with us from the very beginning, you, you know about we had a canoe in the last poem, but of course the ship that really matters is, O Captain, my Captain, because Lincoln is guiding the ship in. So notice the ship of state borrowing heavily from Plato. I think there's a lot of Platonic potentialities here in this poem. Like some proud ship that led the fleet and then, of course, so long. In other words, France is one of those old civilizations as opposed to, obviously, America. Be seems today a wreck. In other words, wow, a, a loss, right? Driven by the gale. You'll remember this word from To the Man of, uh, of Warburg. The gale, a massless hulk, and mid its teeming 
maddened, half-drowned crowds. And of course, the use of the word teeming immediately makes us think about those, the, that, that famous poem, that Lazarus poem uh, of the Colossus, right? Um, of the Statue of Liberty. Nor helm, nor helmsman. And again, we think about, of course, his celebration of Lincoln in O Captain, My Captain. Dim, smitten, star. The word smitten will get used in all these abrasives only in this poem. Fascinating. Dim, smitten, star. Obviously, uh, loss, right? Orb, not of France alone, pale symbol of my soul, its dearest hopes, the struggle and the daring rage divine for liberty. You'll remember that the word rage gets used uh, in not heaving uh, from my rib breasts only, uh, com compelling use of this word here, rage divine for liberty. What is it about France for Whitman? A lot of scholars have spent a lot of time thinking about this. And I think one of the major things is the celebration of liberty, the idea of independence and liberty, and the willingness to fight for those things. Of aspirations, notice the repetition now of, of some words, of, of, and then we're going to get star, star, notice. Of aspirations toward the far ideal. And I think here is this is kind of Whitman as philosopher saying, let's talk a little Plato's Republic, shall we, with the ideal. Enthusiasts' dreams of brotherhood, and again, this idea of, of being together, right? Of uh, we're all in this together. Of terror to the tyrant and the priest. And of course, we've talked about his observations about priests. Go back to Song of Myself 43 when he says it. I do not despise you priests all time, but we sometimes wonder whether Whitman shared some of this idea that the French had that maybe they should be more antagonistic creeds and schools in abeyance. He will say in Song of Myself 1. And now, star and Christian motifs, especially motifs of Christ, come to mind. Star crucified by traitors sold. Um, and a little bit later, we're going to get pierced hands to finish this, this uh, symbolism. Star crucified by traitors sold. Star panting or a land of death. Heroic land. Strange, passionate, mocking frivolous land. Now, it's interesting he uses the word frivolous, and it almost again is following in that tradition of Plato who argues, well, the reason the Greek, that, that, that we Greeks lost to the Spartan is because we were kind of frivolous. We were not as disciplined as we should have been, right? And then interestingly, he uses the word miserable and, of course, we immediately think of Hugo's Le Miserable. Yet for thy errors, vanities, sins, I will not now rebuke thee. Thy unexampled woes and pangs have quelled them all and left thee sacred. Now it's interesting that he will say, I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna really try and point out all of the weaknesses of let's celebrate the strengths of France as a civilization. Then we're gonna get this anaphoria, the repetition of the word in now for at least five times. In that amid thy many faults, thou ever aimest highly. And for Whitman, this is the key. It isn't always what a civilization actually does. It's what it aspires to. It's what it feels called to try to aim at. In that, thou wouldst, by the way, think about the idea of star, and obviously the North Star, and the idea of guiding by virtue of the North Star, which is steady. And we obviously think about Keats and Bright Star, don't we? Same, same notion, right? In that, thou wouldst not really sell thyself, however great the price. In other words, France didn't sell out, even though, even though, of course, they, they had this tragedy. In that thou surely wakest weeping, by the way, notice the repetition of certain sounds in these lines, the W sounds here. In that thou surely wakest weeping from thy drugged sleep, back to, again, back to this idea of frivolous, right? Thy drugged sleep. In that alone among thy sisters thou, giantress, and now he shifts from masculine language to feminine language, didst rend the ones that shamed thee, in that thou couldst not, wouldst not wear the usual chains. It's interesting now that he's going to use this kind of bondage language. This cross, and obviously now we're coming back to the Christ language, thy livid face, thy pierced hands and feet, obviously John 19, the Gospel of John 19, 34 is referencing here, the spear thrust in thy side, obviously at crucifixion as we're, as we're reading uh, the passage of John 19, 34. O oh, star, exclamation point, O oh, ship of France, and then notice again the repetitions of B sounds, beat back and baffling long, notice again the exclamation points, bear up, 
O smitten orb, again star. O ship, continue on. In other words, the idea that in civilization, the study of civilizations, you will have these moments when there seems to be the end or the decline, but he's going to argue bear up, bear on. Now, of course, this is the theodicy question, again, played at large. In other words, not why did this happen to us, but why did this happen for us, right? Notice as well the argument that Whitman is making is that other civilizations can learn from previous civilizations, i.e. autumn rivulets. In other words, out of France flows this notion of liberty, brotherhood, sisterhood, fraternity, democracy, and he will argue, of course, we've pointed this out elsewhere at Leaves of Grass, he'll argue that America is the culmination of all of these preceding great civilizations, all these other stars leading finally to America. And then he finishes, notice the repetition of the S sounds, sure is the ship of all, the earth itself. Now, notice earth is capitalized here. In Spontaneous Me, we saw this capitalization of earth, earth of chaste love, you'll remember this, product of deathly fire and turbulent chaos. Remember his use of chaos in Song of Myself 50. Forth from its spasms of fury. It's almost like birthing language here. Song of Myself 43 will use the word spasms of fury and its poisons issuing at last in perfect power and beauty. Again, we could do a whole study where all we do is just study the way Whitman uses the word perfect. It's over and over again he comes back to it as an ideal, right? Perfect power and beauty onward beneath the sun, following its course, oh, so the O oh, ship of France. In other words, cultural evolution, borrowing, I think, from his study of Hegel to some degree. Finished the days. And, of course, think about uh, what Christ said on the cross, purportedly said on the cross, it is finished. So notice that you've got a lot of Christian language here being played out in this poem. Finished the days. The clouds dispelled. The travail over, by the way, it's the only use in all these of grass of the word travail and it's here. The travail or the long sought extriction, um, you'll remember this word from Song of Myself 23, when lo, reborn, and now we, oh, that's why we have all these kinds of travail and all these birthing words, thinking of course in the tradition of the phoenix, High or the European world, you'll remember the word European being used in Song of the Broad X3, right? And then in parenthetics, in gladness, answering thence as face afar to face, reflecting ours, Columbia. And all of a sudden you get this really interesting uh, uh, realization. Oh, so this is the way he reads history. In other words, Americans look into the, into the mirror of history and we see ourselves reflected, only we're just far more... We're, we're just more beautiful, we're more wonderful, to borrow from a couple of poems uh, ago, right? Again, thy star, O France, fair, lustrous star. It's lustrous gets used seven times in Leaves of Grass, here's one of them. In heavenly peace, notice now the ending of the poem to bring, to bring the celebration of France, this idea that France is still, is still viable. In heavenly peace, clearer, more... Right. Notice we're back to the second line with, 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 the opening, with the opening of the poem. Then ever shall beam immortal. Uh, of course, we think about immortal as it was used as, as I pondered it in silence. Well, what are we going to say about a poem like this? Well, obviously, it's celebratory to France, to the civilization. I think what he's saying is two things here. I think he's saying that great civilizations are important. We have to have them, right? Because they're the, again, rivulet. They're the, they're the carrier of of the ideas to the next generations. But I think he's also pointing out that civilizations are extremely fragile. That is to say, they're, 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 they, can, they can become a lost ship at sea without a mast uh, because the storm can, can really do damage. And again, obviously, this takes us back to, oh, captain, my captain, in the word picture there that he plays with. At 2B, I love the repetition of star and in, but I love the symbolism, especially of star, the North Star, and the idea that we are guided somehow. And, I, and, and of all the texts that we could throw at, I'll just mention Shakespeare's Sonnet 116. It is the star to every wandering bark whose worth so no will his hype be taken. The idea that stars are what guide us in some profound way. And of course, all of us as children enjoyed the experience of watching Disney's Pinocchio, where we w witness kind of the idea of the star, the goal. There could be a cultural star, he calls it France, which leads us finally to 3B. What is for you the civilization 
that you hold up as worthy of celebration, right? What is that for you? What is the, civil, the civilization that is the star? Is it France? I mean, it, you know, is it, a, is it some other civilization that you say, other than obviously your own civilization, in our case, America? And then finally, what about the fragility that he's commenting on here? The fact that civilizations takes forever for them to be constructed, and then it takes very little time for them to be uh, torn down for them to have major cracks and then even to stumble and finally fall. Well, I hope that our study of Leaves of Grass continues to challenge you in any number of ways to think on these questions. Thank you.